Well, good morning once again. As I uh, roughly hit the mic to wake everyone up. <laughs> I want to uh, just say thank you all uh, for being here. Thank you all for uh, the patience you have And especially that you didn't visit anywhere else, because I don't know about you, I get tired of hearing my own voice after a while, especially because I listen to my sermons back to kind of critique myself, and so I I just get about sick of uh, hearing myself talk. But you all uh, have been very sweet, and and as my uh, treat for you guys, and this is a short one, so (laughs) this is for you. This is my thank you, thank you present to you all for the good attention you all have uh, been giving. And so we're going to talk about the measure of maturity. As we go along our Christian walk, we just have to simply recognize that there are different levels of maturity on that walk, that not all of us are are going to be at the exact same point at the exact same time. All of us are on different journeys, on different, well, I I was about to say on different paths, but there's one path, but making different decisions with our lives. But ultimately, we all have the same goal, and that is to be like Christ. But that still leaves us with the question of, How do we judge maturity? How do we judge who is spiritually strong or spiritually weak? I think this is something we all try to do for ourselves, but I think there's also a danger in in, in, casting this on other people and to looking at other brothers and sisters and making false determinations on if a brother is spiritually strong or false. I think why we're wrong a lot of time in those judgments is simply because we're doing it incorrectly. We're using the wrong standard to gauge measure, uh, to gauge or measure spiritual maturity. In 2 Corinthians 10, 12, Paul was having this problem with these kind of super apostles that they were talking about all the, their great accomplishments and all the things they had done. And Paul, of course, not being inferior and also being actually an apostle kind of dispels this. But he says in verse 12, not that we dare to classify or compare ourselves with some of those who are commending themselves, but when they measure themselves by one another and compare themselves with one another, they are without understanding. He's simply saying just comparing other people to other people is the false form of measurement. That's not what you're supposed to be doing. That's not a wise source of measuring spiritual growth. And I think we see that just as humans, we're flawed. If we look in the Old Testament, in 1 Samuel 16 and verse 6, remember when he's choosing who's going to be king and God is presenting the different uh, Jesse's sons and presenting them before Samuel because Samuel's going to anoint one of them king. But look at verse 6. It says, when they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. So part of the the problem with measuring other people is we're missing a whole side of the equation, right? Which is the heart. That's the most important thing, and that just happens to be the thing we can't see. And it happens to be the only thing that God alone can see. I mean, he sees our outward appearance as well, but you know what I mean. But yet we have to make some type of judgment. I mean, Scripture teaches that. In Ephesians 4.13 He says, until we all attain the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. I kind of picture, you remember when you were a kid maybe and you had that, maybe at your grandparents' house or at your parents' house, you had a measuring stick on the wall, a little notches for how tall you are, and you just kind of keep asking anxiously over and over to get marked because you know you want to be growing up but at sometimes you just can't help it right you're not in a growth spurt you're just kind of where you are and i if you imagine that on the top of that growth chart is christ the silhouette of christ and all of us are on that process we're all against that tape measure trying to grow into christ we're all trying to be as christ-like as we can possibly be and that's the goal that is what true maturity is is to be Christ-like. I reject any other form of measurement for what is spiritually strong or what is spiritually weak. I want to look at Christ alone and what his standards are. But I also want to remind everyone that everyone's at different stages on that chart. And we, we all have different levels of maturity. Some of us have been blessed with the benefit of growing up in Christian homes. Some of us have rete- received this teaching. Some of us grew up with not just growing up in the church, but maybe very diligent parents who ingrained in us the love for the word and for the scripture. And we need to be immensely thankful for that, not judgmental about it. 
That's a gift that God has given us that we need to use to help those who haven't grown up in the same nurture and admonition of the Lord. Or maybe someone who, who came to Christ you know, later in their life. You know, these people, we're all on different scales. Don't compare yourself to other people. Don't think just because, you know, one person's younger and maybe you feel like they know more about the Bible than you and maybe that intimidates you or maybe that makes you feel bad. That's not the case. We all have the same goal or we all have the same trajectory, but we're all on different levels. And that's okay. (laughs) As long as we're growing. See, as long as we don't stay stagnant, as long as we're growing, some may grow, have a huge growth spurt and just <laughs> go right up there, and some people may take a little longer. But that's okay, as long as they are growing. And I want to look at three things we use to measure, or at least I believe so. I think one thing is we falsely use, uh, falsely or physical uh, measure that we use, that I would argue is to our detriment, that we look at to gauge who is spiritually strong. I think one thing that I've made the mistake of doing personally is just simply boiling it down to attendance. That, you know, maybe someone who doesn't go to Wednesday night Bible class, they're a weak brother. Or someone who is always there Sunday, Wednesday, attends every gospel meeting, that that's a strong spiritual brother. I mean, it may be the case. It may just be exhibiting because that's within him. But it's not what determines whether he is strong or whether he is weak. I think a second one is participation. I think sometimes I have judged people uh, whether they're spiritually strong or spiritually weak based on if they, how much they had taught Bible classes or if they get involved with song leading or maybe we do outside Bible studies or evangelistic efforts and then when people haven't, or maybe peers my, in my age group at a time when I was a little bit immature, if they didn't engage in these things, I thought, oh, well, they're just spiritually weak then, you know, and it's the, only the spiritually strong people who are doing these things. I think another way that we measure people is by, we have, oddly enough, so like kind of different standards for strong and what is weak as a Christian, boiled it down to gender. That, that if they're male, a strong brother will do this. If they're a female, that a strong sister will do this. Is the standard of Christ not universal? I mean, I think all of us are held to the same standard to grow into Christ. And what I mean by that specifically, because I don't want to be misconstrued, like I said, I think men are judged by if they're song leading, right? If they're you know, getting up in front of this pulpit, that that determines whether the brother is strong or weak. I want to say the pulpit isn't what makes a strong or a weak Christian. It doesn't have some magical power that once you stand up here, all of a sudden you're more holy than everyone else. That's not the case. That's not a measure of Christianity or of how Christ-like you are. I think with women, maybe it's like teaching the kids classes or preparing Lord's Supper, you know, all these things we traditionally expect of women. And again, I'm not knocking any of these things. Obviously, we need teachers. Obviously, we need help. Obviously, we need to be engaged in evangelism. All of these are good works, and absolutely, the Christian must be involved in these things. But it's not what the gauge is for what is spiritually strong or weak. That's not the measurement. Christ is I think there are some problems that lie with just these physical determinations of gauging what, who is spiritually strong or weak. Because if you look at all those things that we kind of traditionally think of as spiritually strong people do, they're very easy to fake. I, mean, I can tell you, it is so easy to, to stand behind the pulpit, to attend church regularly, and be completely morally brank, bankrupt on a day-to-day basis. I mean, not even for a Christian, just as a human being, morally bankrupt. And I've seen that in the church. I've known Bible class teachers. I've seen elders who, are, who have, through events uh, caused by their own actions. I mean, one Bible class teacher I had was in the quarter teaching my class, and he was talking about uh, again, being against worldliness. He got arrested for a DUI, and then just a week later, uh, found out, his wife found out that he was cheating on her, and then he divorced her and left his wife and his two kids. And I mean, this was my Bible class teacher. And guess what? He had regular attendance. Guess what? I sat in Bible studies. I get engaged in evangelistic opportunities with this man. And yet, it seems that he, Christ had never taken root in his heart. That he hadn't dedicated his life to truly being a Christian. In fact, I wish he spent more time on his own just studying the Word of God and reflecting instead of engaging all these outer works because obviously there was something bigger that was the problem. There was something obvious that he should have been struggling with instead of just giving into and then giving the appearance of maturity or of spiritual strength. It's a bad determination. Matthew 23, uh, 27, Jesus says this. Remember, he calls the Pharisees whitewashed tombs. He says, you have the appearance of being beautiful, but the inside you're a dead carcass. 
And so being a strong Christian, according to our standards, that's pretty easy to do. Any of us can do it. But it's not a true indicator of what's in the heart. And this is what every individual here is responsible for. It's something every individual here has to give an answer for. This isn't just an excuse to not go to church or to not be engaged in good works. I think we all know that. We're, you know, we all have brains. We, you understand what I'm saying. God expects this of us, but it's not the determination for what is truly strong. And my problem with it is it's not a high enough standard. Those things are just very, they're way down here. Christ's standard is so much higher. And all in all, like I said, those things are easy to meet, but it's hard to be truly Christ-like. On a day-to-day basis, if you read the Beatitudes at the start of every morning of your day, and then you go out into the workforce, and you interact with your friends, with your family, with your spouse, and everything else, you see how hard it is to match those Beatitudes. Because people will test you. Your patience will run thin. You'll get aggravated. You'll get distracted. You'll be tempted. You'll, the, Satan will try to deceive you. He'll try to remind you of past mistakes. It is very difficult to be Christ-like, to not revile when being reviled, Right? But those are what are true indications of what a strong Christian uh, is or what a tr- strong Christian does. In James 4.11, I think another one more problem with viewing strong and weak through the physical realm is it leaves room for sinful hearts of judgment. James 4.11, he says, Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is only one lawgiver and one judge, and he he who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? Right? That's just a humbling reminder for us that we're not the judge, right? We hold each other accountable. We help. We admonish one another. But we aren't the determiner of you are strong or you are weak based on physical outward determinations. It's based on how much they exhibit Christ. And the more important thing to consider is how I'm reflecting Christ. So that leads me to the true way to measure spiritual strength. Well, how about this for a start? But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no Law. These are fruits of the Spirit. This is what a strong Christian, these are traits a strong Christian will engage in, will exhibit, and will be. So, you know what I think we should do? This may be a little bit radical. I think we should take these and we should rate ourselves on a scale of 1 to 10. How loving have I been today? At the end of every single day, what if we went through these fruits? It, it, It would only take 30 seconds. If at the end of every single day, we think, how much did I exhibit love today on a scale of 1 to 10? How much joy did I express today on a scale of 1 to 10? How much peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control on a scale of 1 to 10, how well did I exhibit those traits today? If we actually put mental effort into this, into exhibiting this, I tell you, those physical things would be taken care of themselves. We wouldn't have to worry about it. So I think this is where we need to start. This is what we need to be rooted in. Those who have these fruits truly dwelling in their hearts can't help it from shining out of them, from it affecting the brothers and sisters. When we are doing these things, engaging in these works, other people will take note. And that's not take note of us, but take note of the good work that you can accomplish with those hearts. And with those attitudes. Galatians 6.1 tells us, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual, you who have these traits, who have these fruits of the Spirit, should restore him in a spirit of what? Of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself lest you too be tempted. And again, there's that humility, right? That you're examining yourself along with this. And a truly spiritual person, they don't have that egotistical sense of self-righteousness, right? Because they acknowledge, I too have been in sin. I too am guilty. And so what's the charge for the spiritually strong here? Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Now, if you're spiritually strong, good, get to work. Help those who aren't quite there yet, who are in the process 
of their growing. Encourage them. Admonish them. And all this requires the inner man to be transformed. Colossians 3.12 tells us, Put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. I, this is, I don't know if this is embarrassing. I cried this morning reading this passage. I was, I'm so touched by this idea, by this thought of a community of people who have the ultimate will to be Christ-like. I just think, man, what would it look like if we were all Christ-like and then just have outward physical appearances of morality? Because it's so easy to just check in here and just act like we're all okay and we're all good and we're all spiritually doing well. What would it look like if we forgave one another, if we lost our sense of ego, if we had true meekness? I mean, there wouldn't be an issue. There wouldn't be infighting. There wouldn't be argumentation. There wouldn't be judgmental hearts. There wouldn't be hurt feelings. It would be only growth. See, all these external things that we try to add to and, and burden on, I, I fear that it complicates the matter and just turns people away from the true measure, which is Christ. So I implore everyone, make Christ the standard, not external things. And I, I just think of a very small example. I know some congregations, well, uh, there was a time where if you wore a multicolored tie like this one this morning, if you didn't have a, if you had a multicolored tie like this, half the congregation would swallow their dentures. I mean, it'd be bad. They wouldn't let you in the pulpit. I was talking to one lady when I was growing up and she told me, it was an elderly lady, and she said, Yo, when they stand up there for the Lord's Supper, to serve the Lord's Supper, I count how many people don't have ties. It's like, I asked her, do you focus on the Lord's Supper? <laughs> I mean, and this woman had been a Christian for a long time, and I'm, I'm not making any judgment on her. Obviously, I just believe that she's really a victim of the culture of the time. But that's the problem is people who sincerely come to Christ, they get bogged down with people saying, making comments like that to them. Like, I, I know people who have been young converts who come to Christ and then they engage in service and they have done a really well thought out a little invitation that they were excited about, that they worked on, and that was truth. And they proclaim the truth and they get down and they haven't even been Christian for a year. And the first thing a brother says is, don't wear those pants next time. They're distracting. I mean, come on. We got to make sure that Christ is the standard. We don't have to worry about the physical things if that is what is instilled and if that is what is encouraged. Everything else will flourish. It will take care of itself. And Colossians 3.14, And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. That's the key. John tells us that what are, what is the world, how is the world going to know us? By our identity, by how good our singing is, by our by our virtues, by how holy we are. He says, by our love. Love is the identifying marker of a Christian. So brothers and sisters, we better be exhibiting it. If that's what it takes to be a Christian, if that's what it takes to be Christ-like, that Christ, that Christ's love is the standard, a love that would die for you even when you lived in opposition to it, that's a high standard. Higher than anything humans can come up with, higher than any form of legalism, Christ the standard. And that brings a challenge <laughs> with Christ being the standard. It's rooted in the belief that reformation begins within the heart. And there's a problem with that is changing your heart takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of effort. And there's no excuse for just not engaging in it. There's no excuse for a Christian to say, well, I don't have time to really discern my heart or to, to really work towards becoming Christ-like. I go to church. If going to church is just your work to become Christ-like, that's not good. That is not good at all. There's only so much I can present in a sermon. There's only so much I can tell you. There's only so many verses I can share with you. At the end of the day, you are responsible for your soul. You are the one that has to stand before God. James says that to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. Well, you are on different situations. I don't know every single decision you're faced with, right? You are the one who's going to stand before God, so therefore, please do the homework. My message for you really is, read the Bible. <laughs> please, read the Bible. It's what we have to do. And that's a point I promised I'd give you a short one, <laughs> so I'm going to skip through some of these verses. 
But I just want to remind that when we read the Bible, remember what James says again in James 1.22, but be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. Just sitting here and hearing a good lesson and doing what you want the rest of the week with your life without taking God into the picture, without discerning his will, that's not good enough. You're deceiving yourself. He says, for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in the mirror. Remember, he's got something on his face. He sees it in the mirror and he just goes about his day right? But tell you, that, that spot, it's a lot more serious if it's sin and not just something stuck in your teeth. If there's habitual sin, if, there's, if your conscience has convicted you of something and you're just suppressing it to the side, you're not, growing to go, you're, you're not going to grow into the full stature of Christ because you have stunted your own growth by refusing to let go of that which is holding you back from being Christ-like. And so Christians, let's work on this, all of this. Me, I'm not just preaching at you guys, I'm preaching at myself. This is kind of why I talked about this is because I feel convicted of these things because I, I have found things that I'm convicted of in my personal life that I need to work on, attitudes that I need to change, attitudes that I need to mature on. And I implore you all to do the same because we're all going to stand before God. We're all going to sit on our knee and bow before the great I am, before the King of all kings. And we're gonna to have to give an account. And I want to say, it is by grace that I have been saved through your blood, and I have been such a poor reflection of your son's image, but I've grown into him through your mercy and patience. And God offers that mercy and patience. And so we should extend it to each other, but he exhibits it and he shows it to those who have obeyed him. You see, we can't expect to be Christ-like at, at all if we haven't begun the very first step, which is decide to acknowledge him as king. You know, you can't acknowledge someone as king or ruler and not do what they say, right? Because you're not acknowledging them. If you truly believe that Christ is the king, that he is the ruler, that he has established a kingdom, that no other kingdom shall overthrow, but that his kingdom shall be an everlasting one, then become a part of it. Obey him. Believe. Be baptized. Repent of your wicked ways. Turn, turn away from those things because God has so much better things for you in store. He wants to give you life, and he's ready to, and eager to give it to you. So I ask if you have any need, please come forward as we stand and sing.